Hello, hi. Uh, Vinit, can you hear me? Yeah, yes, I can hear you. Hello, hi. Uh, hi there. Uh, good afternoon and welcome to another edition of your favorite online show, Business and Banking Dialogue, uh, a daily online show uh, discussing on relevant topics with uh, subject matter experts in the world of finance. Uh, today we have with us Mr. Vinith Rai, founder and chairman of Arohi Group. Uh, we have discussed with him his incredible story of how he built his business with just $100 in his pocket uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, as you know, this requires massive leadership quality. It's not possible otherwise to build such a big empire. Uh, today his group is managing assets over uh, one billion dollar. Today, our topic of discussion is leading from behind, financial leadership traits. Now, we've heard of uh, leading from the front. You know, that's what we are always used to. That somebody, a leader, is always right in the front, but not necessary. You know, if you if you uh, look at uh, many other uh, successful stories, there are leaders who have who have stood behind and said, "Let my people do the work, and uh, I will drive them to their objectives." So Vinita has been done and proven how a leader can build a large business enterprise with leadership qualities. So we will talk about talk about leadership qualities with him. And uh, so how does how did this word come leadership from behind? You know, like like I said, we all have heard of leadership from front. So in his autograph, but in his autobiography, Nelson Mandela equated a great leader with a shepherd. He stays behind the flock letting the most nimble go out ahead, whereupon the others follow, not realizing that all along they are being directed from behind. So a shepherd like uses, uh, you know, he maybe uses a staff, nudge or make some noise and prods and the flock stay, strays too far or they're going to some danger. So otherwise, it's a matter of harnessing a team towards the organization objectives. So we're going to discuss uh, this uh, beautiful concept of uh, leadership, uh, you know, driving business with the leadership from uh, behind, uh, with other, uh, which is just the opposite of leadership from the front, which we all are aware of. Uh, good afternoon. Welcome to the show, Vinit. Thank you so much for having me. Yes. How are you doing? I'm doing quite well. Great. So you're, you're able to hear me well? I'm able to hear you well. Okay, great. So we are, we are approaching uh, a landmark. Uh, you know, next week uh, we will be the fiftieth uh, episode of uh, of business and banking dialogue. So you've been watching. You've been a guest before. Uh, what are your thoughts uh, for our participants? No, I think uh, it's. Uh, I think we are all discovering a new virtual world of engagement. Uh, an engagement that was uh, earlier. Uh, probably, I mean, we always had the tools, but probably we never thought that we can use those tools very effectively. I also believe that uh, given that everybody is sitting at home, uh, people are far more curious and uh, would like to go on such webinars, etc., to engage and know more. And I think uh, that's really what uh, probably has triggered the spate of uh, webinars. In fact, somebody was asking me, Vineet, have you got a PR agency going because you are all over the speaking circuit these days. And I told him I have not done anything actually. <laughs> uh, just that uh, it is easy to actually respond to a request to talk because I'm sitting at home and doing nothing, just a click away. And I think uh, people are also because, uh, uh, so a lot of people are coming up with the ideas of doing this and they're reaching out. And I think people are 
uh, happy to respond as well because it does not mean traveling and uh, yeah. going through a very dangerous Mumbai traffic. True, sir. Yeah, others are following. Uh, we are the leaders. Uh, so, <laughs> so, uh, so uh, you know, I, I was reading uh, on the, uh, the business standard. It said the latest investment of Ishkar Group is uh, thirty-seven million dollars from by FMO, a Dutch entrepreneurial development bank. Yet, BS reported that the chairman says he has no money. Why, why, why so, sir? Well, I think uh, you raise capital not to keep it. Uh, and uh, that has been our motto that uh, you, you raise capital only when you are... Uh, see, remember, uh, every time you dilute your equity, you are essentially raising capital, uh, which is the most expensive one. And if you don't deploy it instantly, then uh, you are actually doing a fairly significant disservice to yourself and to your institution. Uh, and so we raise capital only when we can't see any other path for it. And we normally deploy it uh, in the shortest possible time, sometimes to surprise of our own investors. Uh, who, uh, who, but this is a tendency that we have uh, built ourselves that uh, money is, uh, time is money. And if money is sitting with you, uh, eating time, then it is not going to give any returns. Remember, compounding is a very complex uh, and very simple phenomenon. It's all about time. Every day they compound, it becomes more and more expensive. So keeping money earning 4, 3%, 2% or in current accounts actually earning nothing uh, is just a no-no. So once your money comes, it should work day one. And in our business, uh, our job is to actually take ownership of our downstream assets, companies. So we don't spend more than 15 days and keep the money with us. So the moment it comes, it goes. Oh, okay. So that explains why you said I, I still I don't have money. That's great, sir. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, as a leader, sir, uh, what did you do so effectively in building your business? You can name a couple of them. Uh, can you please repeat? Uh, as a leader, what did you do so effectively in, in building your business? What are the things you did so well that you feel that uh, you could build your business? I think, uh, as you rightly said, there is leading from the front and then leading from behind. And I think uh, both these are actually interesting things for people to know. So the first thing that I, I, I think we all need to realize is what is your strength? So when I started off, I had no money, no people, nothing. So going and proving to others that I'm a great guy and that I'm actually going to be able to do it uh, and or being very earnest about it and honest. So I was actually very straightforward, very earnest. Uh, some people found me arrogant uh, and too direct, but at the same time, I was there and I never gave up. So that was the qualities which were useful to start off with. Uh, yeah. After I reached, started reaching four or five years down the line, I suddenly started realizing that however smart I think I am, uh, the organization is actually having very different demands. So I am a forester. I did not know anything about finance, but I also did not know anything about accounts. I did not know anything about finance as if investing versus finance of managing the finances. Uh, I did not know anything about human resource. So there were lots and lots of things that I did not know. And uh, there are two ways to go about it. One is you actually say, I'll become the best HR professional, best hirer, best this, best that. Uh, and sometimes uh, in a very small organization, you can you actually be, be all that. Uh, you can all be all that. But uh, I think uh, soon you start realizing that uh, you are being pushed out of your depth because you don't have the skills, the core basic skills or the knowledge so that you can. And I think the most important learning that you gain as you actually evolve as a human being and as a leader is that uh, you are as good as the weakest link in your chain, the person who is actually the weakest link in your chain. And therefore, it is not about you anymore. And the moment you start realizing it is not about you anymore, uh, you start thinking about the organization before yourself. And the moment you start thinking about the organization, uh, you start asking yourself, am I the best guy to solve this problem? And there are two answers to it again. Maybe you are the best guy, but is that the best utilization of time? It is possible that you may actually solve the problem faster and better than somebody else. But is that the best utilization of your time? I actually got both the answers. One, most of the places I found I was not the best guy. <laughs> Somebody else could do it better. 
Uh, and the second is wherever I thought I can do it, I realized that there were better things for me to do than solving that immediate problem itself. And once you started realizing it, uh, uh, you also started uh, asking yourself, so what kind of people do you surround yourself with? And uh, finding those people who are uh, really far more capable, far more experienced and far more wiser than you becomes very crucial. So not only did I actually hire people who are smarter, faster, nimbler uh, than me, both in terms of qualification, background, where they came from, what they did, uh, but I also surrounded myself with people who were far better and superior to me in terms of wisdom, experience, exposure. Uh, so people like Arun Dias, who actually was the person, first person I met, who also probably, I don't know why he trusted me. I was actually, a, he and his wife took me out on a drive in Singapore and then also actually committed and became a fund investor. And then he, when he relocated to India, he called me and said, uh, I have, and in, this is actually what I call humbleness. I was a 29, 30 year old guy and uh, Arun had just taken voluntary retirement from Stanchart. And he said, Vineet, uh, I'm, uh, uh, I have a lot of gray hair to offer and you don't have anything in gray in your head. So <laughs> you may actually need it. I didn't understand the meaning of what she was telling at that point of time. But I thought if somebody is so experienced, so wise and uh, so gro uh, globally exposed is willing to work with me, why should I say no? Similarly, Mr. Praveen Gandhi, who was actually, I mean, he set up a company called Hintron in 1971, the year I was born. Uh, when he actually asked me that, Vineet, I really want to help you. I mean, I had no reason to actually decline the offer. Now, there are two ways to react in such situations. Uh, I could have become, every human being has an ego. I also have a small ego. You can actually start uh, enslaved by your own ego and say, why should I actually get Mr. Gandhi in? I already know impact investing. I think that was not the point. I did not know investing at all. And Mr. Gandhi has already done, uh, he set up India's first, probably one of the first venture capital or angel funds and has had a significant amount of experience. He understood technology, et cetera. Uh, and there was so much of learning that went through. So I surrounded myself with people who were much more capable, had seen more world, uh, and were able to guide or at least uh, wrap me on the knuckle without actually really caring about what I thought uh, when things went wrong. And so uh, I think both the things, one was uh, actually finding people who are working with me who are smarter and faster and better than me. So Anurag Agarwal and Manoj Nambia and other people who uh, some of you know quite well, Sushma, Ajay, Manyar, Noshir Kola, my partners, Venkat, Sanchayan, Tarun, these guys were far better educated, far more exposed, gone to US, UK, been done billion dollar deals. Here I was a guy who was actually dealing with million, two million. But I tried to get them in to work with me. And then people like Ajay, uh, sorry, Arun Dias and Praveen Gandhi and Jayesh Parekh and Anant Nageshwan, who actually, I mean, Anant is now uh, in Prime Minister's Economic Council. These are the people who actually, uh, at that point of time, were around 40, 41 uh, year old, and they were enthusiastic and willing to support. And I was very happy to take all the support and knowledge coming from them. I think these two things actually, and recognizing when you need them. See, if I was with $100, I start waiting, I want a much better guy with me, nobody will join. So you have to wait for the time. Yeah. And at that point of time, people will come to you. Yeah, absolutely. Time and places of essence, as I say, uh, absolutely. Right. So, so we talk about uh, you know uh, two important things: uh, innovation and leadership. You know, I mean, these are two important qualities, and uh, which uh, leaders should leaders should have or cultivate within the organization. So, my question to you is: How important is innovation and leadership, and what essential organization capabilities are required for building an innovative organization? So I think, uh, uh, see, leadership, there are different kinds of leaderships and different ways people behave. Uh, and the leadership that you require when you are leading a, let's say, a $50 billion MNC is very different from a leadership that is required to go and take the risk and starting an organization. There are different needs. So when people are actually dealing with 100 people, very different needs. When it, people are dealing with 1,000 people, there are very different skills and needs. If you are actually dealing with a multi-geography, multi-country uh, organization, you have to deal it very differently. 
Uh, I think uh, my learning has been that instincts play a very important role in leadership when you are starting up and structures completely take over when you start going into a larger institution. So in one uh, or in one stage, it is all about your energy, enthusiasm and leadership. So the leadership from the front. In other case, it is about how little you are, how less busy you are defines how capable you are. So if you are actually becoming very busy as a leader of a large organization, uh, then there is something seriously wrong with you. And, uh, uh, and the learning of going from busy to non-busy is really the journey of growth. Uh, innovation on the other hand, uh, and this is again, a lot, a lot will depend on how you want to grow your institution. If you want to become massive, large, et cetera, you have to dumb your institution down. Uh, you, you have to actually find ways to create build structures that will allow your institution to operate at scale. Uh, therefore, it is always very challenging to scale an institution that has innovation at the core of it. Now, of course, uh, one would say Google is a very innovative organization or Apple has been an innovative organization and there have been people who came with leadership and who continue to press forward on the idea of innovation. Uh, but innovation, I think, would require you to uh, inject the idea of innovation, uh, thinking, ability, agility, ability to innovate, you know, ability to actually work within certain constraints and come up with a very new idea. And you have to put it as a culture. So that actually, I think, is a leadership definition. And those who are the leadership has to take with, I want to build an innovation-driven institution, or I want to build an institution that is structure-driven. And when you bring in structure, and that's why I actually keep saying, uh, banking, microfinance, uh, you can actually be quite innovative, but you still have to respect structure. So you build a hierarchy of structure, and then you find ways of bringing innovations within it. Now, microfinance is a very simple thing. We have known for 30 years, go to a village, find five women, make them this thing. You are a social collateral. You give them money, money comes back. But then suddenly you start realizing, hey, uh, you can do this more efficiently in a virtual way. Now, do you need to, if, then COVID strikes and suddenly you realize, oh, while our claim to fame was that we have to go and give cash in the hand of the women and take, collect the cash every week. Now I can't even meet her. So am I going to stop collecting? Then you start innovating. And an institution that doesn't have innovation as part of its culture uh, will actually succumb to the pressure that all the situation, the changing situation will bring. And the institution that doesn't has the ability to actually think this through and has the innovative capability will actually convert into a completely digital institution. Now, if you respond to a crisis and convert and become a digital institution, then one can say you are a reactive innovator. But if you can convert this into a continuous activity, then you will say I will convert microfinance activity into a virtual world where I will carry out everything virtually. And the physical interaction will go down. So you can actually then say, in a path of five years, I would be completely digital and therefore will not require uh, any innovation. And this is something we have done. So in 2012, when we bought over Arohan, uh, microfinance was uh, like anywhere else. It was going through a crisis. We bought it for nothing. And then we said, we actually came up with a vision that we will build an institution that is a financial inclusion institution and not necessarily a cash logistics institution. Because in microfinance, almost everybody's claim to fame was, I go and deliver cash in the hands of the women. And we said, we are not a cash logistics company, so let's take cash out of the system. And yeah. then let's ask ourselves, can we do microfinance? Now that is required the institution to become innovative in every activity it does. Absolutely. So sometimes you can actually put in a trigger right at the top and say, how do you do it? Similarly, for example, Avishkar, just take Avishkar as a fund. We challenge ourselves to do what commercial funds are not willing to do, which is to go and create institutions in broken ecosystems. Now, to go and create institution in a broken ecosystem is a very difficult task. How do you do it and yet deliver commercial returns? Now, the important point is I can go and create an institution in a broken part, but not deliver returns is very different from actually delivering returns. That's where you are actually challenging every person in the institution at all level. From my driver to my partner, everybody is challenged. How do you work? What do you do to actually deliver returns uh, in building the institution? And that's where uh, innovation as a leadership point becomes very challenging and important. Thank you so much. That's wonderfully said, sir. Uh, 
ladies and gentlemen i i continue to have discussion with uh, uh, Vin, uh, vinith rai uh, uh, i uh, welcome to the I, i didn't welcome you so i'm sorry uh, welcome to the show and uh, 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 and we are uh, we can we are now open to take your uh, questions and uh, put it across to vinith for his uh, answers to that we are also in a position to uh, ask a question directly to him so you can raise your hand and you can uh, uh please uh, our back office will enable you to uh, ask the question directly to vinith so uh, in the first part of this discussion uh, i have covered the uh, you know asked vinith uh, queries on leadership and you know he is a leader by himself and so he is he has been able to bring forth to you his what he has done practically uh, now we will uh, in the second part we will look at uh, uh, more on leading from behind model of le- leadership uh, where so uh, so uh, vinith uh, in the in the model of leading from behind model of leadership wherein you must give control to teams while being responsible for not only the company's vision but also finance operations and business development functions so what are the dominant uh, leadership trait uh, trait that you see in this uh, form of uh, leadership i think recognition and acceptance uh, is the most important part the first thing that you need to identify is uh, that uh, you are not the doer deliverer uh, you are basically the person who provides the confidence and assurance to the other person to go ahead and take the leadership now uh, there are lots of people who do it very well and there are lots of people who want to actually be in the front uh, taking the bull by the horn there is i think there is a third kind of leadership which is more closer to behind the uh, or being a leader from the behind Uh, where you actually work as a team so there is no hierarchy uh, yeah. there is there is a clear distinction between roles and there is no hierarchy where everybody knows who is going to be in the front and who is at the back and the front and the back have to be so it's like a driver and a navigator uh, so one is navigating and that's the leader who is actually at the back end and one is driving and we have seen it both as investors where we have invested where there are two founders and one is actually the leader and the other is actually the navigator uh and maybe it is possible the person sitting at the back actually has all the power uh, yeah. but it is very important because the skill to be in the front is very different uh, but if you are in a evolved institution or a strong institution and you want to actually encourage people to take leadership uh, it happens in funds where you are multiple partners and there is a managing partner and there is an incoming partner uh you as a managing partner's job is to actually take a back seat and let the emerging partner do the leadership uh sometimes when you have holding company and subsidiaries we have that in the group the ceo of the subsidiary is actually the all powerful person because uh, he or she actually makes and does everything so all the decision making rests with him but then you have checks and balances from structures which is like having a board having investors shareholders etc that you do in all these circumstances ultimately the most important thing is the person at the behind should not be insecure because if you are insecure then you will start actually meddling unnecessarily now one of the biggest weakness i have noticed in those who find it incredibly difficult to be the invisible leader is they start becoming insecure if the person in the front start getting more celebrity status uh remember that always the, the person in the front starts getting more and more celebrity status because the deliveries are associated to that person uh which is not always 100% true so for example in my own case i get a lot more credit than i what i deserve because i am the face of the organization but the same thing applies to my other colleagues and companies when they are the ceos they actually get more uh, than what they probably are responsible for like i get more than what i am responsible for now i can actually be very forgiving when it comes to me but can become very difficult when it comes to them if i am insecure and i think this is really a critical and important learning that all you have to do is to understand what your role is and then based on the role you have to build and identify traits in you are you insecure if you are insecure it is going to be very difficult to for you to actually go into the setting sun you want to actually continue to be there and continue to control it's a very difficult task and not many people actually make the transition very well uh, it's a, it's an activity that we are all struggling with uh, depending on where we are in our journey uh, power is actually not an easy thing to give up to and uh, so therefore yeah. those who become leaders from behind have to have very exceptional assurance about themselves 
very calm very uh, clear in what they want and what they don't want and once you have that kind of clarity you will allow people to take leadership position thank you wonderful yeah i, I agree with you that the uh, insecurity is something that uh, i think many leaders have to uh, uh, look at and not feel insecure at all because it's at the end of it it's your team which is uh, taking you ahead uh, so uh, so uh, ladies and gentlemen i continue to dis- continue to discuss with vinith uh, please put in your questions so that it doesn't come at the last minute and i'm unable to take it across so please put in your questions as early as possible so uh, uh, vinith you are you are leading an organization uh, with same time working with entrepreneurs and investors who want to drive a social change by building uh, impact business which we we did talk about a couple of weeks ago how do you deal with entrepreneurs who are compulsive perfectionist excessively responsible and obsessed with what they do and this could be even be your leadership not necessarily investors could be even your leadership team who are in that kind of a trait so how do you deal with this uh, uh, with these kind of qualities that come across see when you are dealing with an entrepreneur you we as investors uh, make a decision that uh, when we are making the decision to invest behind an entrepreneur at that point of time you have choosing to become somebody who will be behind the scene the moment you make the decision to give money to somebody you actually have taken into account whether you can go up with that gentleman or not gentlemen or women uh, and whether you actually are going to play a support role or a leadership role and you know the leadership role is the entrepreneur's role now entrepreneurs are of all kinds some entrepreneurs actually go out of their way to seek your opinion some entrepreneurs already know everything don't seek your opinion some entrepreneurs yeah. are great communicators some entrepreneurs are very poor communicators and i think our role in that such a situation where an entrepreneur is perfectionist wants it control wants to follow a certain path is to very transparently communicate what we think and let the entrepreneur continue to do what he or she desires to do uh, but we will not rest quiet we will keep knocking on his in between and keep reaching out to his brain to tell him or her that see we are around and we don't agree with what you are doing so you better have very good reasons to do what you are doing otherwise we will convert it into a question down the line and we will bring it down and it will cost you at some point of time it is very important for us to actually keep the person honest about their approach because it is no more about them alone it is important for them to understand that there is somebody else who's who has actually put in a significant amount of capital and that capital while it is actually trusting your vision your faith etc but our job is to be honest questioner in that now for example that person is doing and is delivering the results then our questioning actually keeps reducing Uh, but if the person is actually not doing not giving the results then the shrillness of our questioning keeps going up and uh, you will need to actually continue to get uh, closer and closer to the entrepreneur to get a very clear idea and try to make sure that the person actually starts switching and combining his or her track with ours and that it should not happen that they are running in one direction and we are actually trying to go in another direction Uh, and so these kind of contradictions do happen uh, i think uh, my personal belief is to let the entrepreneur remind the entrepreneur he or she is wrong let them do it uh, if they believe that uh, what they are doing is right uh, let them make mistakes let them make few mistakes uh, if they make a mistake which breaks their finger that's fine if they break their leg also that's fine uh, we our job is to not make sure that they don't break their neck because if they break their neck then we lose all our money uh, and so do they so so as so in some sense our approach to a leader of of that quantity is to actually be present let them know we don't agree we disagree but let them have the chance to take the decision uh, remind them that they made a mistake uh, and that there is a cost to that mistake and make sure that the cost is not so large that we and they both lose everything that we had so that's the approach that we follow excellent so i actually when you were doing this there's a question that has come from youtube um asking you say or telling you uh, that must be really tough on you because uh, you know generally there are leaders who have maybe a lot of employees so you know that's a very natural leadership that comes 
here you are dealing you are dealing leader uh, your leadership is with entrepreneurs who are have their own leadership capabilities you know and uh, you are dealing with a whole, whole lot of them so does it take a lot of your time in only uh, in kind of getting the entrepreneurs to uh, to be in line with the culture and the objectives of your organization well see again uh, i think uh, it is not entrepreneurs obligation to be in line with my culture it is our obligation to actually make the right decision when we actually choose an entrepreneur and that decision can be wrong it can be right uh, our decision is based on whether what is the mandate that our money calls for so my the money that i aggregate actually asks me the following that we want our money back we want a return back we want you to make a difference in the lives of the people and you have to do all this by supporting an entrepreneur so these are the yeah. four things that we are asked for so now once i know my mandate my job is to find an entrepreneur who is trying to build a business that is making an impact in the life of the people that's really my job my job is not to actually make him successful or a failure and my expectation is that the entrepreneur understands the job he or she does that means if the entrepreneur is in healthcare they understand healthcare if the entrepreneur is in waste management they understand waste management if the entrepreneur is actually in atm management they understand atm management we don't think we understand atm management better we don't think we understand microfinance better we don't think we understand waste management better we don't think we understand circular apparel better we expect the entrepreneur to know what he or she has told us better than what we do our job is to actually ask right questions try to see if the entrepreneur is actually very well aware of what they are doing then we make an assessment of uh, what we believe entrepreneur may or may not know better than us that is mm-hmm. how to build a institution building an institutional framework is a very challenging task and we have to then try to make a judgment if the entrepreneur and we see i to i in building a institution so what is an institution building institution building means you have to bring in governance you have to bring in transparency you have to bring in communication and reporting that actually keeps things transparent between us and the entrepreneur we have to actually have reportings audits insights and my other way a lot of people think auditing etc is just a chore it's people will come and just do something and they will go away and that's auditing unfortunately that's not what auditing is as far as we are concerned we need to actually have a very deep deep understanding of the transparency that's happening now we make a judgment and we try to build because that's our job our job is to build a very good high quality transparent competent impactful institution uh, it is not necessarily what may be the entrepreneur want some entrepreneurs want to be, do what we are trying to do but they have a different way of reaching there we are fine with that if they disagree with us and find a different way to reach it but till the time the objectives of transparency integrity uh, impactfulness are there we don't mind if the entrepreneur finds a better different way from us but if the entrepreneur at some point of time wants to avoid transparency for whatever reason it could actually be he or she doesn't like to be questioned he or she doesn't like to be asked a lot of entrepreneurs say why should i waste my time trying to answer you <laughs> i will do things on my own well yeah. yes you should do things on your own because it's your vision your idea but then you don't need to take other people's money uh if it means we have to confront we will at times confront entrepreneurs uh to make sure that they understand and as i said the confrontation will start by us reminding them that you may be wrong by repeatedly reminding them that you may be wrong repeatedly showing them when they have been wrong and they have created uh, significant losses to the institution and then making sure they don't break their neck <laughs> so yeah. it can become very difficult and uh, well unfortunately whether we like it or not that's the role of the investor yeah very true uh, uh, that's that's demanding uh, uh, like you said it's, it's it's a tough place you are in uh, minit i must say because you are in a very different uh, organization you know so thanks for uh, telling us about it uh, ladies and gentlemen i hope you are understanding and appreciating uh, the role that uh, vinith is playing it's not easy it's just not easy to be a, a leader of entrepreneurs it's, it's it's a tough job that he's having uh so vinith i have a next query for you uh, is reads that a strong leader doesn't like to have strong subordinates and therefore the decision always is his 
and that decision is not consultative but unilateral uh, uh, your thoughts on this so uh, a strong leader who doesn't want strong subordinate is not a strong leader uh, so that's actually then you've got it wrong uh, uh, a strong leader who actually is not able to prove to the subordinate who is probably equally strong uh, that his or her decision is right decision uh, does not necessarily mean that the person is uh, a strong leader a strong leader is one so you don't become strong by showing your muscles you become strong or your authority or your power or where you sit in you become strong by actually making sure and persuading your juniors to accept that you have a better solution now leadership is also not necessarily about taking all the decision yourself sometimes leadership is about absorbing what others are saying and then taking the decision now there will always be conflicts uh, subordinates i i have not come across any subordinate who has not thought that beneath is a idiot uh, so almost all my subordinates uh, actually think at some point of time or the other that this guy doesn't have any brain and he is useless and he doesn't understand anything it's a very natural tendency so if you are a strong subordinate and if you keep undermining your boss simply because you have never been in your boss's position it also shows that you as a subordinate do not appreciate the unique challenges that the boss has as well but a boss who is not able to actually explain to you despite uh, uh, and considers that shutting you up is the only way forward uh, is also not a strong leader so i think both sides needs to understand first as a subordinate you probably don't understand the full picture and since you don't understand the full picture sometimes you have to give in uh, because your response might be tactical and the boss's response might be strategic Uh, and a tactical response and strategic response do not mean the same thing so while you might both want the same results uh, but a tactical response looks very different feels very different and uh, comes on the stage very differently it's very direct very immediate uh, while a strategic response probably is maneuvering yourself to reach and the outcome becomes more important in a strategic response in a tactical response the instantiveness and the speed of response becomes more important so they are very different things uh, a lot of subordinates don't even understand where the difference lies so i think if there is a situation i don't believe there is either a strong leader or a strong subordinate i think there are egotist leaders and egotist subordinates and when the egos clash then you have those kinds of situation okay thank you um so in your uh, journey uh you uh, did you have uh you know you are uh, as a leader of uh, uh, in, in your businesses uh have you been impressed uh, or you been you been following some uh, leadership model in your behind uh, leadership from the behind have you had a role model that you are looking up to so i, I as a person have uh, never looked for role models I, i i don't know whether it's a character trait i have a problem i don't understand i am actually by nature uh, not somebody who get inspired or all inspired by others uh, i do look up to other people's behavior i learn from them i learn i actually look at every leader and look at their strengths and weaknesses both and uh, try to learn from the weaknesses more rather than the strengths that's been my approach uh there are all kinds of people who have impressed me uh, but uh, the person who actually i chose and i forcefully made him my mentor even though he never said he is going to mentor me uh, is a gentleman called vijay mahajan with whom i have had a very interesting relationship since 1998 uh, vijay is actually a gold medalist from iit delhi uh, i think uh, also uh, uh, a gold medalist if i'm not sure but gold medalist from iim ahmedabad founder of basics known as actually the guru of almost uh, most of the development sector and a lot of people across the globe across the globe but for sure all social entrepreneur in india claim him to be their mentor so uh, i have had a very interesting relationship with him uh, and i have learned quite a lot and i have learned a lot from his mistakes also uh, and tried to imbibe as much as i can and i think the uniqueness that i found with vijay mahajan was vijay mahajan is exceptionally bright Uh, mm -hmm. and uh, for around 4 5 years in my life between 2000 to 2005 i was trying to ape vijay mahajan i was trying to copy him uh, and i think around 2006 uh, and i i think i have narrated the story before but in 2006 vijay mahajan actually was about to speech give a speech in a public forum and i was sitting in the audience 
uh, I know he had prepared a speech. He went on the stage uh, and then he saw uh, a regulator walk in, a very senior regulator walk in. So he tore his speech and actually gave a impromptu speech, a very passionate impromptu speech, uh, quoting everybody from phys uh, laws of physics to Shakespeare, all in mm -hmm. one place, all impromptu. And uh, that day I actually realized that uh, the biggest mistake I can make in my life is try to become Vijay Mahajan because he's just too far, too smart, too intelligent, uh, too gifted. I mean, I, he was an IIT IM. That itself makes him gifted. But he was just not an IIT IM. He was a top rank there. But more importantly, an evolved, a very evolved human being uh, with mm -hmm. exceptional capabilities and uh, so what I learned uh, from seeing Vijay and uh, seeing how he mentored me, Vijay Mahajan would always tell me what he thought, whether he agreed with what I'm saying or not saying, uh, but then will never force me to follow his advice. Now, the difference between a boss and a mentor is a mentor tells you, shows you the mirror, but then does not force you to accept his or her wisdom. Now, in India, there is a lot of discussion around mentorship. And I think one of the biggest follies of the current mentors are the mentors actually try to force the mentee to do what they want. Sometimes the mentors have not achieved much, so they want the mentee to achieve. But mentor's job is not to be actually uh, somebody who forces. And so in a, if from a very classical mentorship leadership perspective, I would say Vijay Mahajan was exceptional for me personally. He gave me the freedom to do whatever I want. Uh, we had strong disagreements, but he also actually encouraged me without encouraging me. He never told me, Vinit, you are the best. Never, mm -hmm. ever. He only said, uh, I think I don't see why you cannot do this, but it's up to you. If you don't feel comfortable, don't do it. Or he said, what you are doing is wrong. I disagree with you, but never, even if I went ahead and did it, stopped me from doing it. I think uh, when you talk about a person who can lead from behind, from, from my life, in my life, uh, Vijay Mahajan played a very crucial and important role. Uh, I continue to talk to him even today, uh, uh, even though because he's actually now very busy in certain other areas, so I don't get enough of the time. But I think every conversation we have is actually a brilliant conversation on looking and reflecting around the insights. And I think the, the most important thing is an honest feedback. Uh, same thing I try to do if anybody reaches out to me, Sometimes people hate my feedback, but I try yeah. to be as honest as possible because uh, by being dishonest and sweet to you, I might actually keep encouraging you to do the wrong thing in your life. And uh, so I think uh, the most important thing I have learned from Vijay Mahajan, whose leadership style I have really admired for me personally, I am not actually saying that I really admired his leadership style for his institution, uh, but I learned a lot and I looked at his uh, weaknesses also and learned a lot. But for me, he has been a great mentor, a great uh, leader, and a person who actually gave me the space to grow myself. So, Okay. That's right. Uh, but look, let's look at culture, you know, a culture of organization. And your organization has its own unique culture, you know, and so does every organization. How does culture and bringing that culture to uh, to the various entrepreneurs you are bringing in, to the employees you are bringing in, new employees far and wide in India. How do you, what is the importance of culture uh, and how do you uh, kind of uh, uh, you know, put that culture through the organization? Okay, so this is, this is actually something where uh, academics and institution building comes together. Okay. Almost everybody. So I was actually in a, a industry, in an industry <laughs> Well, earlier in my first job and uh, we were actually put through a process where they said, okay, what do you think is organization's vision? And frankly, I, to me, it didn't make any sense. So whatever they said, we agreed because nobody actually explained to me what is the vision. And then somebody came and said, you should write a vision. You should write a mission. You should do this. This is culture. And I was sitting there and wondering, so how would an organization become more efficient by writing a vision, mission, etc.? Uh, but in 2014, 15, when we actually tried to move from these multiple groups, uh, multiple vehicles within the group, uh, we asked ourselves, so who are we? Who is an Avishkar? What is an Avishkar group? What is an Avishkar group different from Arohan, which is a subsidiary of our Avishkar group? How is IntelliCap different from Avishkar group? How is Avishkar Capital different from Avishkar group or similar to Avishkar group? 
And the big question that we came across is there must be something that binds 7,000 people together. What is that binding together? What is that unique feeling that brings us together? And uh, then people asked us, what is that big vision? Why are we together? What, what is it are we chasing? Are we chasing numbers? Are we chasing 1 billion, 5 billion, 50 billion? Are we chasing 1 million people, 5 million people? Are we trying to transform lives? Are we trying to change lives? Are we trying to touch a poor person? What is it that we are trying to achieve? And then when I hire a person, how do I see this person is right for us or not right for us? What kind of traits are you looking for? Are you looking for independence or are you looking for team player? So those kinds of questions started coming in. And so we went through an, uh, what you call an intellectual debate internally of who we are, what's the vision. And uh, that's when we started realizing that there is a culture and that culture actually is spread across 7,000 people, not one, two, five, 20, 100. And we tried to actually incorporate or engage as many people as we could out of the 7,000. So I think roughly 1,000 odd people in various different ways participated in this exercise. And we finally came across a group culture document for which we had to actually invite somebody else from outside to also engage with us so that they can actually carry out. Because what is possible in this is again, that leadership question comes. I can dictate because I always knew what my vision was. Yeah. But then it becomes my vision, not the institution's vision. So the, the discussion between us and the consulting institution was, can you actually find out what everybody thinks is our vision? So Vineet may think A, uh, Manoj may think B, Anurag may think C, but what about the team and the people and what do they connect with? Yeah. And so we went through an inside out process of engagement, questioning, discussion. And over a period of time, we came to a conclusion that our vision is that we are working to bridge, we are working to bridge the opportunity gap for the other 3 billion. And the other 3 billion actually talks about a vision which is goes beyond India. We are talking about 3 billion people out of the 7 billion people who live in the world. And where do these most of these 3 billion live? They live in Asia, Africa, and Latin America. And who are these 3 billion people? These 3 billion people are we leave the top 3.5 billion people. That means people who are at the top of the pyramid, people who are rich, wealthy, uh, and middle class. And then we move to low income to those who are poor, but economically active. And we leave the half a billion people at the bottom of the pyramid who are so poor that economic activity and entrepreneurship may not be able to make a difference. They require philanthropic support. So very clearly recognizing who we are. And then our, how do you actually bridge this opportunity gap? We actually try to embolden entrepreneurs to take risks. So we would do whatever we need to do to embolden others to take risks that they would not otherwise do so that collectively we are able to reach. So it's not that we are going to reach the 3 billion people, but we as an institution. And that's where the institution clarity emerges that it is not our action, but our action by supporting somebody else. So we are not necessarily directly working with the poor. We are working with the poor through an institution. It could be an entrepreneur. It could be a micro enterprise. It could be a small enterprise. It could be a medium sized enterprise. And we are doing equity or consulting or any other activity to build that gap. And that's really, then people asked us, so, okay, so who are these entrepreneurs and why would we work with them? We recognized and asked ourselves a question collectively. What is it that we are chasing? And ultimately we came to the question we are trying to solve problems that are worth solving. And it's very important. It took us a lot of time. Any problem, setting up a dating platform is also a problem. That's how Facebook yeah. will born. But do you clean India by not selling to the government, but uh, by creating wealth out of waste? Is that a problem worth solving? I think it's a great problem worth solving. Do you need to actually provide sanitation services to every Indian? 2009, can you come across a problem like that in 2009, five years before Swachh Bharat Abhiyan and put in equity capital to do it? Yes, that's a problem worth solving. And that's really how we have actually defined. Every act is what is the problem worth solving and then put in harness yourself and go there and try to make a difference. So I think what we have tried to do is 
use this to integrate the entire institution and build a culture around that we are actually here as a lever. We are not the actor, we are the lever. And our job is to propel people using the lever and the shaft to propel people to success. And therefore, we are going to be always the second guy. We are not always going to be the first guy. We are the second people and our job is to celebrate the success of others. That's how we define ourselves. So, uh, so leading to that is a question that's actually come in. Uh, saying that since you've worked so much uh, in rural uh, areas, uh, you know, far and distant rural areas in the poor and underprivileged, uh, yeah, it's fine to have a leadership uh, from the urban and maybe tier one, tier two kind of cities. Have you come across rural entrepreneurship? That is people in the village and in the poor, they themselves have seen some uh, in, in senses of, uh, you know, they're coming out to entrepreneurship. And can you explain at least one if you have come across? So actually, it's uh, uh, see, the, it's it's quite funny actually because uh, I think uh, most Indians, uh, were a large number of Indians actually in early seventies, eighties, nineties, and I think KK, you might have also actually. It's not necessarily everybody was coming from Mumbai. <laughs> they were all coming from small towns, very small towns, sometimes villages as well. My father actually studied till class tenth in a village, and I actually had never seen Mumbai or Delhi actually till I was in class twelfth. I was in Jaipur, Jodhpur. Kota and uh, Varanasi and Patna, but I never seen Delhi. So, so I don't think so. A uh, rural is as distinct, but I have actually invested in people uh, who came from remote rural parts. So my first uh, incubation activities were when I converted a tilting bullock cart into a business model was by a gentleman called Amrit Bhai Agrawat coming from a remote part of Pakistan border in Amreli oh. in, uh, okay. in Gujarat or uh, a three wheel tractor that came again from Junagar, again on Pakistan border. Uh, I invested in a company called uh, Jameen Organics, which was not a successful company, but it was actually owned by 400 odd farmers, oh. all owned by farmers. So these were all farmers. Uh, we have recently made an investment in a company called Ergos, which is actually in Samastipur in Bihar, where the entrepreneurs come from Bihar, Samastipur. Uh, they are not illiterate. They are not, so I, I don't know when people say rural, what do they mean? The people in rural India are like you and me. So they look like us, talk like us, and are like us. And uh, uh, if you meant that they don't speak uh, English, uh, uh, I That's have actually important. invested in people who don't speak English. Uh, a large number of people, when they speak English also, may not sound like English to you. Uh, Indians in any case speak very five, five or 10 or 15 times of English. Uh, most of us struggle when we go to England to talk to people who are British in English. So when we speak in English and they respond to me, we seem like we are talking in two different languages. So I personally believe that uh, uh, all kinds of investments that I have made, entrepreneurs are everywhere. I think it is the ecosystem and the training and the grooming okay. towards the opportunity where the challenge is. Uh, there are all kinds of entrepreneurs, very bright ones. Actually, some of those who are not educated and have not gone to MBA, uh, are instinctively far brighter because we have been dumbed down during an MBA uh, by the process of a Western thought process, which needs, need, need not necessarily work when you go. And I have actually found incredible challenges to pick up people who come from very urban and very polished backgrounds, especially coming from very large MNCs to convert them into entrepreneurs. They are very difficult to convert into entrepreneurs. But those who are coming from completely broken ecosystems, become entrepreneurs far much uh, far more easier they find it a little difficult to actually give up the ownership claim and then transition to a large entrepreneur so guys coming from big institutions find it difficult to start and those who are coming from very marginal backgrounds find it difficult to give up control and these are simply because you're coming from different backgrounds and you have different understanding uh, in your journey you have to evolve both the sides have to evolve in their journeys. Uh, but any given day, I would actually uh, not hesitate to invest in a person who's coming from a non-MNC, non-mainstream background, uh, because it's easier to mold them up. The other guy side is already molded. It's very difficult to unmold them. So my preference uh, has in general been to go with those who are slightly, who needs to be molded, rather than those who have already developed personality and then uh, very yeah. difficult to be molded in a different way. Thank you. Super. Uh, 
appreciate uh, what you're doing, Avinit. Uh, so, uh, Vinit, you know that we ask, we also have given opportunity to participants to ask a question directly to you. Uh, so, we have Mr. Samamurthy, experienced banker. Uh, he would ask, would like to ask you a question. Mr. Murthy, please unmute yourself and ask the question, please. Thank you, Mr. Vinit Rai, for wonderful insights you have given and sharing your experience. Uh, you see, I'm a great admirer of academic excellence, though I couldn't achieve much of excellence at all. But uh, do you see any pitfalls of intellectualizing a business? And related to that, uh, is there a, uh, does academic excellence lay strap for intellectualizing business? So you are talking to an, you are talking to another person who actually has not done uh, incredibly well in his academics. So I think you and I both have a bias, probably. But let's actually what what no, I have sorry, seen. Yeah, let me clarify. It's, it's not directed to you. I'm, you have seen a lot of people intellectualize in business. All of us have seen, right? right? And I've seen that people who have you know bootstraps and then who can't speak even good English. I've seen them creating great wealth. I mean, I'm sure you also would have seen. Are there pitfalls of intellectualizing a business? Yeah, so I think language, in my view, is a, if you don't speak English, that's OK. Because I, as far as I'm concerned, uh, beggars in UK also speak English. And they, they are not good for anything further. So uh, I think uh, language, in my view, English is actually probably a massive deterrent. Uh, English is one component well of intellectualization. English yeah, so uh, yeah, it's, it's a very yeah. small part of it and yeah, probably right. inconsequential. I think intellectualization, in my view, would be when you overthink the situation and uh, overthinking of a situation or, or much higher analysis makes you a great consultant, but not a great actor. So if you want to be an entrepreneur, you need to take decisions and move forward, uh, which, is, uh, which is very different from actually thinking about every potential possible reason that can go wrong, which is a very important exercise, but it is a very different skill set. So you are absolutely right. Uh, I think uh, for an entrepreneur, uh, action is action and balancing, uh, defining what your boundaries are, understanding your limitations and weaknesses, and excelling within that is what an entrepreneur is. Uh, an intellectual person is somebody who can actually think far more superior than an entrepreneur, but can deliver and not ex take any actions uh, despite knowing all the information. So. I think there's a significant distinction an entrepreneur must actually act. Uh, so if you can't act because you are over intellectualized, it, then you can't become a businessman and therefore can't build business. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Murthy for a good question. And uh, uh, I have another caller, uh, Harish. Uh, can you, Harish, can you please unmute and ask a question? Harish. Yeah, uh, yeah, we need. Uh, it's always a pleasure to to hear you because your eloquence is amazing. To actually, you know, explain a concept or, for that matter, a particular, you know, theory. So kudos for that. But more important, my question is: I've seen the world over, as well as more so in India, that both uh, first generation entrepreneurs as well as second generation family owned businesses, right? Uh, when there is a scale up required value creation stage. Every company you know, comes to a stage whereby really you have to be ruthless about the scale up and the value creation. Otherwise you miss the bus, right? That's where sometimes the, the entrepreneur who's started off as an owner operator, right? Uh, his role is a, as an owner operator since startup days. And he has to you know, basically get back and become an owner only because this, and then give it to and you know, hand it over to professionals where, because they can create far more value because it requires a lot of, but uh, you know, it's uh, easier uh, said than done in India. Uh, has it changed over the years in your opinion, because you meet so many entrepreneurs and have invested? You see, I think uh, uh, there are reasons for it. One is actually India is changing, uh, but it is changing behind the Western and the uh, North American cultures. Uh, for many, very different reasons. For example, selling your business was considered bad, while selling your business is a normal entrepreneurial in and out strategy, uh, especially in venture capital. So now venture capital in India only arrived in late 90s, 95, 96, 97, and actually became really active only post 2005, 6, 7, 8. 
So really the whole concept of somebody coming, starting a business to actually exit is a new thought process. Business was done for many generations. So the business was never actually done that I will come, I'll make, I'll sell, I'll make money and go out. It was never done like that. It's a new thought process, which is now uh, in the first generation entrepreneurs coming in 2020 is like uh, they are coming in to make money. They are not coming in to run a business. Uh, in fact, it has become to a other extreme now that nobody wants to run a business. They want to actually start a business and then sell it off quickly so that they can make some money and get out. Uh, it's also a very rapid wealth acquisition, uh, uh, wealth accumulating uh, methodology now. So therefore, venture capitalists and investors need to be very careful when they are coming into these businesses and investing to understand what is the objective of the entrepreneur as well. So uh, significant changes have taken place in the lives and minds of entrepreneurs. Uh, the new young entrepreneurs don't really think that far. But I think if you look at the statistics, the middle class entrepreneur or the middle aged entrepreneur in India is the one who is actually delivering more successes for investors. So the entrepreneurs who are between 35 and 45 or roughly a little below 50, 35 to 48 are the best category to invest because they have the maturity and the stability and the risk taking appetite and as well as the institution building maturity. Uh, I think the other thing which is very critical in the current environment uh, is that when you take money from professional investors like uh, uh, the venture capital funds and private equity funds, and I'm leaving out the impact investing funds, but venture capital and private equity funds, and you can include probably impact investing funds, you have to deliver and build an institution sometimes from zero uh, or sometimes from day six, years two or year three to year seven and eight, between one to eight, uh, people are asking you to build a 1,000 crore revenue, 2,000 crore revenue, 5,000 crore revenue. Now, this used to be a 100-year plan. So we are trying to squeeze a 100-year plan to, into a five to seven-year plan. And if you are a first-time entrepreneur, that's a very high uh, amount of volatility in your daily life. You are literally running on a treadmill, which is an unending test treadmill, and therefore it can actually become very taxing at times. Uh, but very crucial and important that uh, one needs to really understand uh, what you are trying to do and where you are going. The mindset of the entrepreneur has changed quite dramatically from 1990s to 2000s to 2020. Today's entrepreneur really is very few entrepreneurs are in the business of holding on to their business. And ideally, if you want to hold on to your business, you should either not raise money or not raise significant money from the external investors who have a 10 year time horizon from start to finish. Thank you. Thank you, Harish. And uh, thank you, Vinit. Uh, I know we can't end the session without uh, a query uh, on today's uh, environment we are living in, COVID. And uh, there's a lot of buzzword on empathy from a lot of HR leaders. So your thoughts on COVID and uh, the role of leader who has to play a lot of empathy to employees at this moment of time. Yeah, no, I think, uh, uh, yeah, COVID has actually changed all the mathematics for everyone. So absolutely, uh, I don't think so. There is any challenge in accepting that we are all struggling and uh, whether it's me or with anybody else, we are all struggling because your top line is vanishing, your bottom line is vanishing, and then you have to take care of your employees as well, who unfortunately are in a very difficult uh, situation. So if you ask them to go, you don't know where they will go. I actually, when the start of the COVID, if somebody goes back and Googles me on LinkedIn, I had uh, shot a video of my own self using my own mobile and put it on this thing, uh, encouraging startups to find different ways of extending their uh, survival timeline, uh, but avoid firing. And I actually had said that uh, there are better ways of doing it. Let's assume for a minute, you have 10 employees and you want to get rid of three of them so that you can bring down your cost of uh, uh, running your business to 70% or 75%. Uh, then the other alternative way is to cut down salaries across the bid by 25 to 30% uh, so that everybody actually gets something rather than three people not getting anything. Uh, the results will be the same for the institution but uh, you would be able to give a longer lease of life both to your institution as well to the people who are working with. Now, I am not saying that this is actually, this act of charity should continue for a very long period of time, 
uh but if you are taking that decision because not because uh, they are not delivering on their commitments or they are not committed to you etc cetera, etc cetera, but because you want to lend in the timeline for your own survival or reduce the cost base for yourself then uh, then this is a much better way of doing it uh, there are other better ways of also doing it and people have come up with different ideas and suggestions but uh, given the challenges and circumstances uh, as much support as you can give you should give having said that i have also noticed some people try to take advantage of you trying to be nice to them so empathy works on both sides it's a, it's a challenging situation uh, and those who try to take advantage should also be equally dealt with at the same time so uh, word of caution empathy is a very important a very important instrument but uh, or a very important feeling we should empathize with people's situation but do not let empathy become your weakness if people try to exploit it thank you so uh, vinit as usual a fantastic session with you uh, you know you have been so informative so incisive uh, you know all those you have said we covered a whole lot of topic uh, right from leadership traits and what what makes a, a good leader uh, what's a, uh, what are the leadership qualities and many other aspects of uh, leadership so uh, uh, vinit thank you uh, once again uh, thanks for coming spending time with us ladies and gentlemen i leave you with this final thought Uh, from Ben Ambuster, he says it is better to lead from behind and to put others in front, especially when you celebrate victory and nice things occur. You take to the front line when there is danger. Then people will appreciate your leadership. With those thoughts, I leave you. Thank you very much for being with us for a one hour. Thank you, Vinit, once again. Hope to see you again at some other point. Thank you. Bye bye.